demons, disease, death, devil, all of them got them covered, but she'd heard about Jesus and what he could do and believed if she could just touch his garment, she would be well. In the midst of her pain and her trial and her suffering, somebody had told her about Jesus. The flow of her plague was on a collision course with the flow of his power. And wherever the flow of sin is confronted with the flow of the power of Jesus Christ, Jesus always comes out the victor. He says, the child is not dead, but sleeping. He was redefining death so we would understand it is just a temporary condition. If you don't know Jesus, you're dead. But if you're a Christian, death is just a temporary condition. But the words of Jesus just kept ringing in his head and his heart. Do not fear. Only believe. No matter what your struggles or your sorrows, whatever whatever you're going through, listen, you're never bothering Jesus. Friend, here's what you need to know this morning. If you've got Jesus, nothing's ever going to separate you from him. Mark chapter 6, I'll be there in just a moment. The sixth chapter of Mark records for us the last time Jesus ever went to his hometown, the tiny town of Nazareth. This was the place that the Bible said of him in Luke chapter 2, verse 40, he grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. It was home. Robert Frost said, home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. John Maxwell said, I once heard someone joke that home is the place where family members go when they're tired of being nice to other people. Bill Cosby said, human beings are the only creatures on earth that allow their children to come back home. John Ed Pierce said, home is a place you grow up wanting to leave and grow old wanting to go back. Jesus was raised in Nazareth, but he'd been gone for a while. Now, he'd made his headquarters in Capernaum, and he'd just completed a successful tour of ministry that had included the healing of the woman with the uh, issue of blood for 12 years and raising the synagogue ruler's daughter, Jairus' daughter, He was 12 years old from the dead, and now he's going home. Someone said, as a rule, one has a sense of anticipation about going home, especially to a place where one has had a happy childhood. Home is a place where one is loved and known and accepted at face value, a place where someone can take off their shoes and snoop around looking for something to eat. Home is the place of a thousand memories. Home is where one walks down the street and sees old friends and familiar sights and greets neighbors and acquaintances at every turn. So we come this morning to Mark chapter 6, verse 1, and I want us to look at what happens when Jesus goes home. Would you stand for the reading of the word this morning? Mark chapter 6, verse 1. Mark says, he went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages, teaching. You may be seated, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. We notice, first of all, the compassion of Christ. Why did Jesus go home again? I think you're going to be surprised by the answer. Luke tells us about a previous visit, about a year earlier, Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 21. He went to the synagogue, as was his custom, 
And he was handed the scroll, and it was open to Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. And here's what he read. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, and to comfort all who mourn. And he sat down, and he said, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And the response of the people was they were livid. They were full of anger. How dare this young man claim to be God, which is what he was doing. They grabbed him, Luke tells us, and they they took him up to a hill, intending to throw him off of a cliff. But in Luke chapter 4, verse 30, he says, but passing through their midst, he went away. He literally walked right through them. He said, now wait a minute, how was that possible. A mob's getting ready to kill him, and he just walks right through? Well, in John chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. The charge I have received from my Father. Jesus was God in human flesh. So why would God go back? Why would Jesus go back to his hometown, Nazareth? Well, notice, first of all, his patience. Verse 1, there can be really no other explanation than his patience. Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. His patience. How patient has God been with you? How many opportunities has God given you to become all that he wants you to be? Secondly, his purpose, verse 1. He was going to give the people of his hometown one more opportunity. Maybe there would be someone who would respond. John 4, 34, Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. What was his work? Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Third, notice his persistence, verse 2. Mark says, as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Jesus identified himself with the place where the Word of God was proclaimed. It is a great thing when a man of God takes the Word of God and teaches the children of God in the power of the Spirit of God, in the house of God, for the glory of God. But it's equally great when we identify ourselves with the place where the Word of God, the Bible, is taught. Now, as a side note, the synagogues in those days were constructed in such a way that they pointed toward Jerusalem. So that when Jesus stood up to teach in the synagogue that day, he would have been facing Jerusalem. He would have been facing Calvary, facing the cross, where he would one day die for the sins of the whole world. So in that setting, here is Jesus standing in their midst, teaching the Word of God. He was being persistent, hoping someone there would believe. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And it's not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. When Jesus went home to his hometown, it was all about grace. Giving them one more opportunity, one more chance. The old song says, Grace greater than all our sin, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. What grace? So what do you think would be the response of the people to the patience and the purpose and the persistence of Christ? Well, secondly, we see the criticism of the crowd. Verse 2 says, and many who heard him were astonished. The word means to be struck by a blow. 
Mark chapter 1, verse 22. It's the same word used there when he was teaching in the synagogue. And it was as if they were slapped upside the head. They were shocked. They were flabbergasted. So what were they astonished with here? Three things. His words, his wisdom, and his works. Now, Jesus didn't do any mighty works there, so they must have been relying on reports that they had heard, but they were overwhelmed by his wisdom and his authority. They couldn't comprehend it. And they responded with two statements. Notice in the text, verse 3, they said, isn't this the carpenter? Now, when you just read that, you, at first glance, would not understand that this really was a statement of derision. Isn't this the carpenter? Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, had been the village carpenter. Nazareth was a a village of about 500 people, and he was probably the only carpenter there. And so no doubt he had done a lot of work for those people and would have been well known. And when he died, most likely Jesus took over that, that carpentry business. And so he'd built tables and chairs and yokes and plows. He, he, he'd probably done some remodeling projects in homes of those people. He may have even built many of their homes. We don't know. Scripture doesn't say, but we do know he was there for 30 years. That's a long time. So they said, isn't this the carpenter's son? He's just a carpenter. But one day, Jesus would walk out of that old carpenter's shop. He would walk out into the world, no longer to build plows and yokes and chairs. Instead, he would build lives and he would build his church. The day would actually come when he would be placed upon a cross prepared by another carpenter, and he would give his life for us. But make no mistake, my friends, he is still building today. He is building lives, and he is building his church, and souls are being saved, and eternal destinies are being changed forever. He's more than a carpenter. But they didn't stop there. They made the second statement in verse 3. They said, isn't this the child of Mary? Now, at first glance, we would read that and say, well, of course it is. Mary's his mom. That's not what they were saying. This was actually a statement of slander. You see, the first time Jesus came back to Nazareth, they had said, is this not the son of Joseph? But now the common gossip about his origin and his birth was coming out. Over in John's gospel, John chapter 8, verse 41, Jesus was confronting the Jewish leaders and he said to them, you are doing the works of your father. And down in verse 44, he said, you're of your father, the devil. And you know how they responded to that? They said, well, we weren't born of fornication. In other words, we're not illegitimately born. You were. It's a pretty strong response. You see, Joseph wasn't the the father of Mary's baby, and so therefore, since they couldn't prove it, they said, this is is an illegitimate child. Therefore, everything you say and do is illegitimate. And then the last part of verse 3, they brought up his brothers and sisters. They said, his brothers and sisters are, I mean, this is a common person. We know who this is. I mean, why in the world would we be paying attention to him? And you do remember his brothers and sisters, his family. Mark chapter 3, verse 21, they showed up and they thought he was out of his mind. They tried to get him away from people. And the last part of verse 3 says, and they took offense at him. Now, that's not strong enough in the English language. In the original Greek, it's the word skandalizomai. We get our word scandalous from this. They were outraged. This is a scandal, they said. It was absolute blasphemy that he would claim to be the Son of God. By the way, it's the same word used in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, where Paul talks about how the gospel is a, is a scandal. It's scandalous to the Jews and it's folly to the Gentiles. Over and over, the Bible talks about how people stumbled over the gospel, how they stumbled over Jesus. There was also the small town phenomenon. How many of you were raised in a small town? You know, there's a difference about a small town. And there's an unwritten rule that really no one in that town is supposed to rise above anybody else. We're all the same. We all kind of... And so when somebody does kind of rise above, sometimes people take shots at them and and try to bring them back down to earth, you know. But it was so much more than that here. This was blatant unbelief. 
This was outrageous antagonism. You know, they couldn't refute the message. They couldn't renounce the miracle. So what they did was they ridiculed the messenger. So we see the compassion of Christ. We see the criticism of the crowd. Notice thirdly the consequences of their choice. Three things happened next. Number one was a rebuke. In verse 4, Jesus responds with one sentence, a pointed proverb that pinpointed the real issue, their unbelief. Unbelief is ugly. Unbelief obscures the obvious. It elevates the irrelevant. It resents the messenger. In fact, they resented the message so much, they eventually hung the messenger on the cross. He said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. Did you hear what he said? The circle keeps getting smaller. He says, a a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and, and among his relatives and in his own household. Now, everyone in this room knows it should be just the opposite. The one place where you are loved and the one place where you are honored ought to begin at home. And it should be among your relatives and and certainly your hometown. I was raised in Oklahoma and I'm a Texan though. I still cheer for, still cheer for the Oklahoma Sooners whenever they played football and and because that's I was raised on that. I listened to them on the radio when I was a kid growing up. They beat all kinds of people by 60, 70 points. I'm sorry, that's in my blood. I can't change that. But I'm a Texan. I'm a true Okie from Muskogee, but I'm a Texan. People say, where's your home? I say, Texas. Lived here long enough. I've lived any place else in my life. But a lot of times when we used to live in Florida, and we, we, we'd drive back to Oklahoma, and there's a little town. I can't remember the name of it, but there's a little town, and there was a big sign outside this little town on the way back to, 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 to Okmulgee, where my wife is from, and Muskogee, where I'm from. And this little town, and I can't even tell you the name of the town, but I can tell you about the sign outside the town. It says, Home of Reba McIntyre. Now, there's a small town that's going, oh, she's ours. That's the way it's supposed to be. Your hometown is the place where you're supposed to be loved and encouraged and honored and respected. They wouldn't have any of it. And so Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. His own brothers and sisters didn't believe in him until after the resurrection. So there was a rebuke. Secondly, there was a restraining, verse 5. Mark says, and he could do no mighty work there. Now, I want to be very clear. It wasn't a power problem. Jesus always has the power. Can I get an amen? He always has the power. The problem wasn't a power problem. The power was a people problem. The people didn't believe. You see, the purpose of miracles was to attest to the truth, and they refused to believe. So when people decide to reject the truth, all the miracles in the world won't help them. Remember the story that Jesus told, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, Luke chapter 16? The rich man went to hell, Lazarus went to heaven, paradise, Abraham's bosom, Abraham's side, whatever your version of Scripture says. And the rich man begged Abraham, would you please send Lazarus with just a a drop of water on his finger to touch my mouth? And Abraham told him, that's not permitted. You can't go from heaven to hell, hell to heaven. You know, it's not like being at Disney World and getting a park hopper pass where you can just kind of go wherever you want. No, there's a great gulf fixed between the two. And so the rich man says, well, at least have Lazarus, Lazarus go back and warn my five brothers back on earth. Abraham said, no. That's not going to happen because he can't go back. But then he made this statement in Luke chapter 16, verses 29 to 31. He said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And the rich man said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. I need to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, someone someone has risen from the dead. His name is Jesus, and still the majority of people in our world don't believe. 
It is not because of a lack of evidence. The tomb is still empty. No, no, no. It's because of an overwhelming sense of unbelief and rejection. So because of their unbelief, Jesus was unable to do any mighty works there. You know, I was studying that this week, and I, I was just wondering to myself, I wonder how many times you and I have missed something phenomenal that God wanted to do in our life because of our own unbelief. He couldn't do what he wanted to do. Not because he didn't want to do it hard, strong enough, but because they didn't want him to do that. Not now, not here. Thirdly, there's a remnant, verse 5. Have you ever heard the the old saying, God always has a remnant? Here's here's what you need to know. He does. No matter how evil the world becomes, no matter how dark the times are, God will always have a remnant, and we see that here. Even in the midst of the darkness of unbelief, demonstrated by his own family and his friends and the folks from his hometown, there were a handful there who did believe. So how do you know that? Look at the last part of verse 5. Jesus laid hands on those who did believe and were sick, and he healed them. Apparently, there were a few folks that said, well, we believe, and I have a sick sister here. I have, my, my mom is sick. Could you? My, my, my dad's not feeling well. And we believe, and so he, he, he healed them. I have two closing thoughts. The first one is, Mark says, and he marveled because of their unbelief. Verse 6. He marveled because of their unbelief. He was amazed at the fact they didn't believe. His own family. His friends. His hometown. I had the privilege to speak at my, I went home from my, 40th high school reunion, had the privilege to speak at my old home church, and of course they have a new facility now, and a lot of those people didn't know me, but there were about 30 of my classmates there that morning. I cannot tell you what an honor that was. I I can't put it into words. I mean, one guy who was an unbelievable football player who uh, put his arm around me, and he goes, you were my hero in high school. I didn't even know he knew who I was. Now he's a men's minister in Oklahoma City. Uh, Another girl who walks up to me, and and, and she gained a little bit of weight. We all do, okay? But she came to me, and she said, you don't know who I am, do you, Barry Cameron? I said, ma'am, I'm sorry, I don't. And when she told me her name, I nearly fell on the floor. And I won't say her name, but she used to be one of the cutest cheerleaders that there ever was. (laughs) And she said to me, she said, I just want you to know I'm so proud of you. I, I can't tell you what that means. But you know what means more than friends? Family. And here's Jesus, and his own family doesn't believe. And his friends don't believe. And the people in this little village who would have mostly, all of them, known him by name, he was amazed. Are you kidding me? You don't believe? Have you ever thought about how foolish unbelief is? Think about it for a moment. Unbelief chooses eternity in hell over eternity in heaven. Really? Unbelief chooses Satan over Jesus Christ. Now, you'll have to pardon me on on that one, but that's completely unbelievable to me. Unbelief chooses sin over salvation and darkness over light and and an everlasting burning fire over streets of gold and unspeakable joy. I just don't get it. And he marveled at their unbelief. You know, there's only two two times in Scripture where where the Bible tells us that Jesus marveled at somebody or he was amazed at somebody. Number one is in Luke chapter 7, where Jesus marveled at the faith of the Gentile Roman centurion who had a servant sick at home, and, and he showed up, and he said, listen, I'm a man under authority. I know how this works. All you have to do is speak to I know you have the power. You don't even have to go there. And Jesus was amazed at his faith. The only other time in Scripture where it says Jesus was amazed at someone's right here, when he was amazed at their unbelief. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Here's the second thing. Verse 6, he left. He left. Scripture says, and he went about among the villages teaching. 
Jesus never returned to Nazareth. Let that sink in for a moment. Now, his family, here's the good news. His family finally came around. In fact, Acts chapter 1, verse 14 says they were all there after the resurrection. Now they believe. That's wonderful. But the Bible doesn't say one word about those friends or the folks from his hometown. Unbelief is a horrible sin. Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 18, Whoever believes in him, Jesus, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. You know, i got to be honest with you. I, I get a little tired of people taking shots at the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was an ad in the paper this weekend about, uh, have you been burned by a church? Well, come to our place. And Folks, i got to tell you something. They don't teach the Bible. They're living completely contrary to the Word of God. You know, you know, listen, instead of talking about people who've been burned by the church, why don't we talk about the fact that they love darkness rather than light? You know, the reason why people don't want to be under the teaching and preaching of God's holy Word is because they love their sin. Let's speak the truth. I think Christians ought to start standing up for the church. Say, I love my church, and I'm proud of my church, and, and if somebody tries to fire off an arrow toward your church, take it out. Now, don't take them out. Just take the arrow out, okay? <laughs> Be gracious about it. Jesus said, here's the judgment. The light is coming to the world, but men love darkness rather than the light. They choose not to believe. By the way, unbelief, a lot of people say, oh, well, that's not a sin. Yeah, it is. In fact, some scholars believe it is the chief sin. In fact, Revelation chapter 21, verse 8 says, No unbelieving person will enter heaven. It's that serious. Well, my concern this morning is not your hometown. I, I, my concern is not even your home. My concern is your heart. And my concern is... I want to make sure that Jesus is a prophet with honor in your heart. Because if he is, he'll be a prophet with honor in your home. And he'll be a prophet with honor probably in your hometown. Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now that, my friends, is the greatest news this world will ever hear. Let's pray.